Hi there! Welcome to part 3 of our VR tutorial series. In this tutorial we are going over our latest Scratch 8.6 VR features – Stitching and Ambisonic Audio. Let's first have a look at our new stitcher. Therefore let me load two sets of clips to create two separate stitches. I will use the depth parameter here to tell Scratch to just go in one level on the folder structure and put everything it finds on that level and its subfolders into one slot. Done! This way we have all the cameras required for each stitch in their own slot. Next click the Stitch 360 button here. I'm gonna select full timeline for the scope and set the sync to timecode so all clips are synced together. Also I can select the resolution of my stitch node. The default is the same resolution as your timelines. In this case 4K with a 2 to 1 aspect. Lastly I can select a stitch template from Huggin, Autopano, PTGUI or from Scratch VR itself. A template contains the positional data and lens information of the source camera shots that are the inputs for the new stitch node. The template is applied to each new stitch node that is created in each slot. Let's try this way first and hit execute. Now all the separate clips are combined into stitch nodes. Let's enter into the player, go to matrix and to the VR stitch menu. If we click the globe button here we can switch the viewport into 360 mode and take a look around. Another viable option is to enter dual view with hotkey D and put the right view into 360 mode but keep the left view showing the X rectangular image to work on. Obviously we can also connect an Oculus or HTC Vive and look at our stitch through our headset. Ok, but what if we don't have a template to load up front? Let me reset the stitch node. This is what it looks like if you don't load a template upon creating the stitch node. All the cameras are lined up next to each other. I can still load a template here but in this case let's hit the auto calculate button and let's scratch have a try in stitching this shot. Ok, so this stitch did not go well. Why is that? Probably because some of the cameras here have their lenses covered and scratch was unable to determine overlaps between them and the other cameras. Let me scroll into the clip a little bit and use another frame for the stitch. Hit auto calculate once more. Now we have something that looks like a good stitch, although the image is upside down. Let's go over the tools we have inside the stitch node to further tweak our stitch. Obviously the first thing we want to do is to recenter our image. Therefore I could use the numeric controls on the right. For example fill in a value of minus 150 for the roll parameter in order to flip the image roughly. However there's a much more convenient option here. If I enable drag here, I can simply drag the image in the viewport to recenter it. I usually do this by grabbing what's supposed to be the bottom or south pole of the echo rectangular image and dragging it down here, like so. We can grab the image at other points to further tweak it. Next, let's have a look at the camera details window here. If we call it up we can see the stitching parameters for each and every camera used in the stitch. If I enable the image mask option the colored highlight shows me which camera is being placed in which area of the echo rectangular image. This camera for example is placed a little bit too high so I could for instance modify the pitch parameter to make it line up a little bit better. Also I can modify multiple cameras at once by control selecting the cameras and changing the value. Like so. This makes sense in case I want to change for instance the lens type or lens parameters for multiple cameras at once. Let's close the camera details window again. Next we have options here to tweak the overlaps and seams between all cameras. For instance we have an option to compensate for different exposures between the cameras. Further, Scratch allows us to select a seam finder algorithm. The adaptive option calculates the seam for each frame and hence requires more processing power whereas the non-adaptive one calculates it just once for the whole clip. We can change the seam finder algorithm and also choose different blend modes. As you can see, the best option is already pre-selected by Scratch. However, 
The simpler blend modes can be useful when working on the color matching of the individual cameras. Let's have a look at how this can be performed. Therefore, let me create a version of our stitch and set the exposure compensation and the blend mode to none. At the bottom of the right side stack, we can switch to the sources tab and take a look at our node tree. The stitch node being at the very top, being fed by all the source nodes below, so the flow of data is from bottom to the top. Now I can work on each individual camera by selecting it here in the node tree. But obviously, if I want to match a camera to the others, I need to view them in context. So let me select the stitch node here and lock the viewport to that. Now I can select the individual cameras in the node tree and still look at everything in context. Now let me adjust the gain for every camera. Primarily, I'm looking to match the snow here. Cool. Now that everything matches much better, let's go back to the stitch node and turn on multiband blending and also the exposure compensation again and compare our manually adjusted stitch to the version before we did the adjustments. Very well. Let's have a look at some more advanced cases. For instance, in some situations you want to tell Scratch which area of the image to use for stitching. This can easily be achieved by drawing a canvas on the source clip which in turn generates an alpha channel that the stitch node will use. Let's select this one and just quickly draw canvas. If I turn on alpha view, you can see the alpha this canvas generates and which will be passed on to the stitch node. This especially helps if the clip contains a black area around the actual image content. However, we can also work the other way around and tell Scratch which areas to specifically exclude from the stitch to force the seam finder to take a different path. Let's go back to our source, delete the layer and create a new one. Now by creating a mask on this layer I can cut out things, like for instance this part of the rig. Now looking at our stitch node, you can see that Scratch now uses the content from another camera to fill the gap and the rig is gone. However, that is not possible everywhere, which is why we are seeing a black area here. This brings me to another example. First, let's enter dual view again. Now we are seeing the stitch node on the right side and select the source node for our left or working view. This way we can edit the mask a little bit so we don't have a black hole anymore. And at the same time we can watch the result on the right. Ok, so what we want to do now is to remove the remaining part of the rig as well as the shadow here. Therefore let's draw another canvas around the area of interest. like this and load our vector paint plugin onto this layer. It also appears here on the structure view as an input to our source shot. Let me select a smoother paintbrush and set the brush to clone. Now put the cursor down where you want to take the image data from and hold down control and drag the cursor to where you actually want to paint and release the control key, like this. And now let's paint the rig and shadow away. Note that keeping a two-up view also requires a bit more processing power than just working on one view. Since I'm doing all of this on a MacBook, which is pretty cool, I'm going to leave dual view and save some resources by just looking at the camera I'm painting on. If I want to see the result in context, I can just quickly hit D again to view the result on the stitch node on the right side. Done. The rig and the shadow are completely removed. Now that we've set up our stitch in general, we can go ahead and start grading or stabilizing our shot if needed. Let me just add one layer to the stack to adjust the overall gamma a little bit.
However, as the stitch is very processing intensive, you might not see real-time playback. To compensate for this, we can use Scratch's caching system. Therefore, have a look up here at the process menu. There's an option called Cache Shot Input. This means that all inputs to a node are getting cached to the node's format, which you can select in the media menu. As we're now parked on the stitch node, with this we would be caching each and every source clip being fed into the stitch node. If we now hit the cache shot input option up here, Scratch will render the whole stitch to our preferred format and work with the freshly cached files, instead of decoding all six cameras and calculating the stitch on the fly, which leaves more processing power for our creative tasks. Done! We can now play the shot in real time and continue with our grading. So now that we've extensively looked at how to treat video in VR world, let's have a closer look at the audio that needs to be added to the immersive experience. First of all, what is ambisonic audio? Ambisonic audio is full sphere surround sound. It's not the same as just multi-channel audio, but rather represents a sound field. There are two common formats of ambisonic audio, MBX and Fuma, both of which are supported by Scratch. These days ambisonic audio can ship as a separate file in the .amb format for instance, or it can already be included in an mp4 file along with the corresponding 360 video. If that is the case, Scratch will recognize it and play it back correctly. Let's go to the editor and to the audio menu. Here I can load audio locally, which means per clip or for the whole timeline. Let me select an ambisonic audio file here. Clicking the Ambisonic Setup button here will bring up the Audio Mixer panel with the Ambisonic tab selected. Here I can see how the four audio channels are positioned around the viewer. If I put on a headset and turn my head, all the sound sources will track accordingly with the headset motion. With the sound field position parameters, I can move the overall position of all sources around. This is needed if I recenter the video either here in the editor or in the matrix. And hence, need to readjust the audio position as well. The updated position parameters will also get rendered into the resulting MP4 file or published to, for instance, Facebook, YouTube or Scratch Web. Note that next to loading ambisonic audio, you can also load individual sound files into Scratch and position them in a 360 environment. Scratch will use this position for playout to a headphone set. However, this is not the same as ambisonic and Scratch will not render this audio as ambisonic, but just as separate audio channels. For final delivery, you want to render out an MP4 file, as that currently is the only format that supports ambisonic audio. When rendering an MP4 and having ambisonic audio as a source, you will see this drop down here in the Format Settings tab of the Output node, letting you choose to render either MBX or Fuma ambisonic format, but also giving the option to just render as plain audio without the ambisonic setup. Let's go with Fuma and enable all four audio channels. Next to rendering out an MP4, you can also publish directly out of Scratch to an online portal. If we go back to the Timeline and to the Tools menu, we can enter the Publish menu and this way publish our 360 material directly to YouTube, Facebook or Scratch Web for online review. This concludes part 3 of our VR tutorial series. Hope this was useful to you and see you next time. Bye!